an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM certified wellness coach. You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie. Today, I want to talk about the corrective exercise program that NASM has. Well, not so much about the corrective exercise program, but about some research that has been done using the NASM CES, the corrective exercise specialization. And so this started, it came up because over the weekend, or maybe it was on Friday, I got an email from Brian Sutton, who has been on this podcast on several occasions. I think he's actually pulled off a three-peat, so he's been on a few times, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's been a while since I've had uh, a guest, and I think you're probably all going, Rick, it'd be nice to hear somebody else's voice. So I'm probably going to start lining up some guests, but he sent some research to me. He was like, hey, I found this research, and so on it were a lot of the NASM folks, like Mike Fantagrassi and um, Chris Miller and some of these guys, and they get the research. We get research, and this was research done on the NASM CES on forward head, rounded shoulders, protraction. This is Yonda's upper cross syndrome. So you've heard of upper cross syndrome. Again, forward head, maybe slightly elevated in the scapula, protracted scapula, internally rotated at the shoulder. And so what they did is they said, okay, well, I'm pulling up this research. And they talked about the research being done and what was good about it is they are explaining some of the things. So the introduction of all research, not only is there an abstract, which gives you an idea of what the article is about, but it also gives you the details. So it talks about the three types of patterns according to Yonda, which is the upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome, and then the layered syndrome where you see both of those things happening. So upper cross syndrome, you've got this the posterior upper muscles and anterior muscles in the neck. Some of these are, are what are referred to in the text as tonic. So when you hear the word tonic muscle, it's, it's like an overactivity of the muscle. Well, we refer to them as sometimes shortened muscles or overactive muscles. They refer to it as tonic. So these muscles are tonic, they're shortened. And then the deep muscles of the neck and some of the smaller muscles in the spine, the posterior scapula, these are referred to as phasic, P-H-A-S-I-C, phasic, phasic muscles. And these are referred to as underactive muscles. You've probably heard me mention phasic muscles before uh, in, in relationship to the glutes. So I'll talk about the glutes being a phasic muscle and maybe because we sit on it, we inhibit it by sitting on it for so long, right? So these tonic muscles, overactive muscles and phasic muscles, underactive muscles. And what they are doing is, is two types of interventions. They are going to do, uh, ergonomic education. So let's teach them about like ergonomically how to set things up. And then the second thing is we're going to uh, apply a 12 week program using the NASM corrective exercise model. And we're going to see if this helps with a control group. So there are a lot of therapeutic methods that are already kind of employed in order to help patients with upper cross syndrome. And you see that being used in physical therapy. They use it in body conditioning, retraining, and tapes. So the adhesive kinesiology tapes, many things are being used to help kind of maintain better posture with upper cross, forward head, protracted, rounded thoracic spine. And these are referred to as common methods. So NASM has the corrective exercise model, which has four positions in it. So there's the first one, which is inhibit. 
Second is the lengthen. Third is activate. And then finally, there's the integration portion of it. And and I will say this very important. They, they applied this model fully. So many times when these get applied, people pick their biggest thing. Like manual therapists will do the inhibit, but maybe not so much the lengthening, rarely the activation, and uh, certainly never integration. Sometimes we miss parts of the puzzle. Some people just focus on stretching and not the inhibiting, not the strengthening. Sometimes we see the first three going to, they'll inhibit, they'll lengthen, they'll activate, but never an integrated where we're teaching those muscles in their new position to work with all the other muscles in order to be able to produce movement along with their compatriots. So that's an important part of the NASM corrective exercise model. Well, this study, it's a semi-experimental study where they took a statistical population of teachers. These were all teachers in uh, Southwest Iran. And they was, was done in 2018, but the study came out just recently. And they made these arrangements. So only teachers that had severe, uh, significant upper cross syndrome. And so what they did is they did a photographic study where they would put uh, a, a dot on the tragus of the ear, which is the ear hole. They would do the acromion process. They'd do it the outermost part of the thoracic spine and then the lowest most part of the thoracic spine. And so they're going to see with these dots align how much forward head, what are the angles that are here. And the criteria for being a participant in this study was that there had to be more than 42 degrees of kyphosis the forward head posture had to be more than 45 degrees and the rounded shoulders more than 52 degrees. And again, this was done by uh, photographic technology. They take the, the, the photo of it and they measure by, um, by, by doing measurements and angles based off of these points that we talked about. So they evaluated these angles through this means of photographmetric methods, that lateral view with those landmarks. And then they had a control group and they had an intervention group. And what they did is they prescribed the plan for 12 weeks, three sessions a week, and then they could last between 45 minutes to 60 minutes. They would start off rather slow, so uh, less time in the beginning weeks and definitely minimizing some of the, the harder effort stuff that they would do early on. And then as they progressed, they would add in some additional things. So here's some other things that they did. That's the, that's the corrective exercise portion. But here were the ergonomic, um, I, I guess not corrections, but really like data points. So let's talk about what ergonomic training can we give to them? So there were seven basic things for ergonomic training. And I'll, I'll go through those checkpoints. So the things that they would state for ergonomic training. Number one, avoid bending forward on the desktop and leaning in the front portion of the desk. They want you to maintain a nice, neutral, S-shaped curve, not be in the shape of a human cashew with your thoracic spine. So they would say, okay, let's go into neutral spine and maintain that. Number two, support was provided for the lower portion of the back. So they put a little support in the low back. Number three, natural posture of the body in the neck and back areas to, is to be maintained and bend forward, backwards, and sideways was avoided. Number four, support was used for the feet. Number five, staying in a fixed position for a long time was avoided. So you can't just stay and sit at your desk all day long, which is probably why people do the avoiding for number one, which is that leaning forward on the desk so often. Number six out of seven, here we go. When teaching and writing on the whiteboard, the hand was kept in a place where the shoulders were less stressed, which means they were not very high. And then they also didn't write down very low. And number seven, checking the homework behind the student's desk was avoided. So no peering over what's going on with the students. And as a student, I would say just in general, I'd feel a lot better if that wasn't done. Oh my goodness, I couldn't stand that. So they say, okay, well now we're gonna take specific dates and we're going to not do any real additional physical activity. By the way, these were not physically active 
teachers. So they weren't teachers that already had a workout program, anything like that. So this is the only intervention that was taking place in the physical activity during that 12 week program. And they performed uh, their work activities every day as normal for the rest of the 12 weeks. So what did we find out? What was the takeaway here? Well, really what we found is, this is what they said, the exercise in the study had a 90% positive impact on reducing the forward head angle, an 88% positive impact on reducing the rounded shoulders, and a 90% positive impact on reducing the kyphosis angle. Therefore, Considering the significant degrees in forward head, forward shoulders, kyphosis, kyphosis angles of the participants in this experimental study group, the NASM corrective exercise program accompanied by ergonomic interventions, those seven statements that were presented, have satisfactory effectiveness. The effectiveness of the NASM exercise was also supported by other studies. And then there are some other studies and authors that were listed that talks about the implementation of the NASM CES and finding positive outcomes. All right. So this is a big deal. I love this because I love getting the research that comes out and says, hey, check out some of the stuff that's out there that helps to support. Um, a system, right? Because rarely are systems implemented in research. And NASM put the system together because there's a lot of positive research that comes from inhibiting, a lot of positive research that comes from lengthening or stretching those overactive muscles. Certainly positive impact that comes from the activation and strengthening of underactive muscles, integrated movements where you get them to move together. Again, positive research. But what NASM did is they put it together in a system. Well, systems are hard to study. And the reason being is that when you put something together in a system, you don't know if it's the per first part of the system, the second part, the third part, the fourth part that actually did the benefit. And that's why research is done at such a microcosm level. It's so myopic. It picks one piece usually in studies. But when you study the system, it was also nice to see this. They also point out in the study that there are other interventions that are used, but they don't use the inhibitory techniques that NASM uses. And that it could be the addition of the inhibitory techniques that differentiates this study from some of the other studies that didn't have that portion that made this effectiveness so much greater. I thought it was a cool study. I appreciated it. Uh, this was just a, so you know, this is the Journal of Research in Health Sciences, and it came out in 2019. So 2019 is when this came out. And it was done by uh, Karaman, uh, Radaman, Radanama, and Gesemi, and et al. So there's a, another list of folks here. And it, they did a great job with the study. It was a nice read. And it is something that if you get a chance, you want to look at the article, you can look at the article. But this is a nice little summary of it. If you have questions for me, you have anything else that you want me to look at, any research that you want me to tackle, reach out to me. Let me know. You can hit me up on my Instagram at dr.rickritchie, or you can email me at rick.ritchie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, at nasm.org. Thanks for listening. Remember, like, subscribe, leave us some feedback. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you think of the podcast. We appreciate it. And once I've started asking for it, several people have started adding in, like, here's some feedback about the podcast. People have given their rankings on uh, the, the Apple uh, store and the Google store and, and on the YouTube and the Facebook pages. So thank you for doing that. Please continue to do so. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks so much. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.